Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for one of the most insightful, real presentations that I've definitely seen, just the way that you captured what happened in your path on Neck of the Woods. And for anybody that might not know, the gentleman that's sitting next to me, Mark Olson, CEO from Tropical North Queensland. If I can just let you take us back Mm -hmm. and take us to just those critical Simple questions that everybody in regional tourism, state tourism, everybody in all different le- levels, um, what, what they should be thinking about leading into the summer season. Yeah, so we're in October and that in Queensland is Get Ready Week, um, this week in October. Also, we've seen all of the news around the world around Hurricane Milton um, crossing the coast in Florida. It should remind us all that our responsibility in tourism is not only for creating the good times and bringing visitors to the region, but keeping them safe and looking after our industry. So in 2023, we had one of the biggest floods on record. We had 44 metres of rain fall over six weeks. Um, We had 3.2 metres fall in just seven days. So here we are in beautiful Mackay, just the most beautiful place. That's double their annual rainfall in seven days. We would love to think that that's just never going to happen again. But somewhere in summertime this year, and South East Queensland is facing storms at the moment, another tourism destination is going to find it hard to deal with Mother Nature and the effects of climate change on our environment. So as an industry, it's so beholden on us to look after our tourism businesses financially and in terms of their mental health and wellbeing in dealing with yet another crisis. We've been through COVID, we've been through pilot strikes, we've been through infinite number of things in our industry, um, but it seems like the rate of those big events is increasing. They happen more frequently, there's less gap in between. And businesses are fatigued. And if we want to have a thriving tourism industry at 2030 or 2032, if we want to thrive in 2030, we need to be supporting businesses holistically, not just driving visitors to their front door, but making sure that they're ready to thrive. It was so poignant in what you touched on about mental health and mental well-being as much as the economical, because the, the struggle is real in the, in the times of, of crisis. Yeah. And I was thinking about you. Mm how you manage that when so much was on your shoulders Mm. and so and just the decisions that had to be made really quickly what was your process as a real leader for Mm. media for everything anyone who's in this industry of regional tourism loves tourism right like we all love the industry and we love our operators so what drives me and drives us is How do we look after our operators? How do we look after the industry that keeps us in a job? Um, You know, 3,900 tourism businesses in our region, 670 members of TTNQ. Our first focus is how do we help them? Because this is going to be tough. Um, And the way we can help is by being ahead, being ahead of the situation. We can't ask the industry to be ahead of everything. Their job is to look after their staff, to make sure we keep people safe. So there were so many things thrown at us. And of course, Murphy's Law says it's going to happen when the last time you want it to happen. So the cyclone crossed the coast on the 13th of December. The airport flooded on the 17th of December. Um, So we were working right through the Christmas New Year period, working seven days a week to try and get things going again. Yeah, I said in the presentation, we have 53,500 visitors a day in the region. They need to be looked after. They're somewhere, and many of them want to get home. They want to get home for Christmas. We had people who wanted to see their family for Christmas. So tourism industry is more than just a good time industry. We are definitely part of the fabric of the community. We're a big employer, one in five jobs in our region. So a lot of people were facing a really tough time. So you kind of have to put yourself a bit back a notch and just lean in but we're all human thinking about your own team thinking about my team many of those young staff had never been through an event like that before they'd never been through a cyclone crossing the coast they didn't know what this flooding could mean i had two staff members um, who were significantly impacted one had her house totally flooded so you're dealing with your own team you're dealing with an industry you're dealing with a national end because we're an international destination, a global media response to the event. And my ask today of the Australian Regional Tourism 
collective here at the convention was have we thought about how to scale up and be ready to support our industry, our staff, and deal with the media crisis um, when it happens? Because simply responding is too hard. You have to be ahead of this. You need a really great network of support. You need a really good, clear plan, and you need to have made as many decisions in advance as you can. And I mean, I've never taken so many notes. I can't wait to do a little write-up from your session. It was notable just the level of crisis, even your operators and the industry saying this is actually worse than COVID because this is we're doing this is something that we're facing alone. Yeah. And different operators, even within your region, would have been impacted in different ways. Yeah. With things like so, at the moment, I'm doing some work with accreditation, for example. And there's been a study from the School of Digital Economy that accredited operators do better in crisis because they're kind of you're almost forced to have a think about the questions that you pose to industry today. Yeah. So even yeah. though, yeah. even for our operators, that it's something like, oh, great, we've got to do something else. Yeah. Oh, what would you say to that in terms of like that preparedness and asking, get start now? And I love that, that Queensland happened. It's like, get ready. Get ready week. Get yeah, ready week. Get ready week. week. It's in October. Yeah, it's always in October. So, you know, my grandmother always said a stitch in time saves nine. Oh. Um, you know, it's an yeah. old phrase from, yeah, yeah, from yeah. old England and Ireland, um, but it is absolutely true. So I don't doubt for a moment that an accredited business is more likely to recover quickly because you have to be proactive. So if all you're doing is responding to changes in the environment, you will get exhausted and you will fail to make decisions that you need to make in a timely way and you will end up quite isolated. And it's really easy in a crisis situation to become isolated and the average response from a normal person um, is fight, flight or freeze, right? So people either say, I'm out of this industry, I'm done. They step up and they know what they've got to do. But a lot of people freeze. A lot of people don't know what to do. And we heard from operators in remote communities like Cape Tribulation, Woodgill Woodgill on the Bloomfield track just saying, I can't get access to the internet. I don't know how to get these grants. It's all too hard. I'm just going to let it go and I'll see what happens in a few months time and that is how you kill a business right cash is king if you're not having cash flow the faster money goes back through the till the more likely your business is to survive so how can I start small ways of making a little bit of money how do I move a little bit tomorrow that I didn't do yesterday how do I start to keep the wheels back in motion and I think this is the most important part of the PPRR so preparation preparedness um, recovery response and recovery we spend so much time thinking about what are we going to do when it happens and how are we going to recover the real work is done in the preparation and pre-preparedness what can you have at your ready at your disposal and it might just be five people you've spoken to who've said i'll be there for you i will be there for you so if you need my help i'll be there for you And then you need to follow up with one quick text or email to say, well, what would that be? What could you do? So I talked today about um, the events that happened in December 23. I was on a mission in India with Tourism and Events Queensland. So I wasn't with my team. I wasn't with my industry. I wasn't in front of the media. I was still coming back from India. So had I not been able to get back to the region, which was entirely plausible, I could have missed the window of opportunity to get back in the region. There could have been more time that I wasn't able to be the person in front. So who does that? Have I, is that agreed? Do they know yeah, they're doing yeah, that? Simple yeah. things that we need to be doing in the industry. And I know a lot of people have been through this. Hey, yeah, yeah, I do this. I've got a crisis comms plan. I just encourage you in October every year to just run through it in your own mind. So what? So what if it happens in December? Who would do my media if I can't do it? How do I get information quickly to inform decision-making from government? How do I build a really compelling case for what I need to get back? And what does that look like? Because most of us are running the tightest ships we've ever run. We have the least spare available discretionary spend. We don't have the staff to get behind it. We're running on thin margins and running on the smell of an oily rag. So how are you going to scale up to do this, recognising that some of your staff might not even be ready, they not may not be available to help you. So I think this is the bit that we don't do really well. It doesn't have to be rocket science. I can see, as you said, the 
impact of accreditation makes you think about your business and how do you firm it up. Um, and I'd love to see the tourism industry take preparation preparedness seriously and really think about how are we going to help each other? What does that mean in real terms, not in theoretical terms, and not where's the folder that has my crisis comms plan in it, but as the Ghostbuster said, who are you going to call? Oh, I, uh, I love that because it's like make keep building those relationships to have your go. Who's your Ghostbuster? Who's your who Ghostbuster? are you going to call in call? this moment? Because yeah, there's yeah. only so much you can do on your own. Yeah. Brilliant. The other third brilliant question that you pose to everyone that I absolutely love because they, we went through the Victorian bushfires in a regional area. I had a hot air balloon operation at the time. But every season after that, it was bushfire season. Yeah. So now to avoid that, but I love what you said. What is the content you've got ready to send to the media to yeah. tell this real story yeah. of what's happening? Yeah. And I just thought that was brilliant in your content perspective and the media, managing the media. Yeah. And, and that's a plan you have to have in advance. So we planned that about three years ago. We had a number of sessions in October every year with our local tourism organisation, so our network of partners around Mission Beach, the Tablelands, Cooktown, Cape York, to say, okay, so if a cyclone crosses the coast at Mission Beach and we want people to know that Cairns Airport is open for business, who's filming it? What are they saying? We need to be respectful. We all want to say our thoughts are with our friends in whoever is affected, but we need to let you know people here are safe. This is what it looks like here in Cairns yeah. today. And what we found from media, particularly the national mainstream media, is they were very receptive to having story ideas pitched to them right there and then. So every morning we would put a couple of ideas forward. I've got this operator who's already back to operation after the flooding, the airport story, the 24 hours, they were reopened. So we were proactively pitching stories of recovery and resilience rather than saying, isn't it a shame the media always focus on the negative? They're just responding to what's in front of them. Yeah. And we have a responsibility to say, I've got other ideas for you. There's other ways that you could tackle. So you have to be on the front foot. You also have to call it out. And this was some hard conversations we had with some of the national media around even where they frame their images. So I remember being interviewed very early one morning on a breakfast television show, um, standing in front of a tree that had fallen down. And I made it very clear, this is the only tree <laughs> on the Cairns Esplanade that is down and the, the work crew have just turned up they're about to take it away so you know it is important for people to kind of stand up at some time and go Let, let's just call this out you know yeah. we do over dramatize the message at time we're not saying it's false it's just a slant so we need to be willing and got to be willing and able to challenge that slant and remind people oh, how many you. businesses are open but you need evidence so you know we had a, a survey running by phone touching base with operators, seeing where they were at, keeping a log on who was open, when they were reopening. So every day I could front the media and say, 150 businesses reopened yesterday, here, here and here. We're back to 80%, 70%, 90%. Those things are important and the media want to engage in that. You can't just walk in and go, can't you do a good news story for us? You need to have thought it through and you need some evidence, something to back you up. Oh, and that would just be just as well received. But I love that. Just having the foresight and awareness to go, come on, guys. Yeah, we can do better. We can do better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What a blessing you are. What a, like, really an inspirational leader. At the time, and we talked about, and I love who you're going to call your Ghostbuster. You are loved beyond your borders. Giovanna Leber, and I have to acknowledge her. I remember at that time at Sparrowly, she gathered us all. Yeah together with the Girls at Tourism Collective and myself and Liz Ward and said, let's do a one-pager, anything that can help Mark out, yeah. he needs our help. And that's yeah. just what this industry is about, isn't it? Yeah, and that was huge from Giovanna. And I think if you're going to offer support to somebody in a situation like that, Giovanna did it exactly the right way. Don't give the person another job, just tell them, this is what I can do for you and, and I'll send yes. it straight through. You don't need to think about it anymore because yes. we're small organisations, there's just a handful of yes. us working on the industry supporting all those who are working in the industry. So shout out to Giovanna. Shout out to Giovanna. It's just all recalling that because yeah, yeah. it is an important thing when you see it on the news and you say, I want to help, but I don't know how. Yeah, yeah. But G just came through and said, this is what, what I can do. do. And you said, yes. yes. Like that's, yeah. yeah so absolutely. on that note, thank you again. I know you're on your way out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you to everyone for watching and uh, keep again. doing all your great work. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.